geocaching faith. That title might not make any sense to you. Are you familiar with geocaching? I had to look it up to see if it was still a thing, and it is, by the way. Geocaching was an activity 20-ish years ago. I was introduced to it by my good friend Beth. It was a, it's like scavenger hunting, if you will, except you use a GPS. Back in the day, before smartphones, she bought a little GPS unit, a couple hundred dollars back in the day. You go to a GPS website on the internet, and you look in your area or wherever you happen to be traveling, and you find what's called a geocache. We hiked to the top of a mountain, a beautiful scenic overlook. You get the coordinates, and you search. Basically, go on a scavenger hunt. Follow the coordinates on the GPS, and there, where you look, and it might be under a rock, it might be in a bush, it might be up high, it might be somewhere very creative, it might be in an old wall in the center of a city. This was at the top of a beautiful overlook, somewhere in Franklin County, Pennsylvania. I forget where it was now. We found a box, a plastic box, like a pencil box from school. It was weatherproof. And opening it up, there's a little notebook and some paper and a pencil. And you write a note about your experience that day. And you sign it and date it and put where you're from. And then you can read all the other people from around the country and around the world who've been at that exact same spot. You bring something with you on your geocache to leave at the site. It might be something from your hometown, wherever you're from. It might be something that represents you. And you leave it in the box, and you take something out of the box. And so things get left behind in this box as a way of remembering who was at that site. It's a silly, fun way to, number one, just get out into nature and enjoy things and become active. It also teaches us what a very small world we really have when you see notes that someone was at your geocache site from Amsterdam, Holland, or from Denver, Colorado. It's kind of cool. Our GPS systems actually developed during the Sputnik era, and they became satellite systems that were meant more for NASA than for you or me. But boy, what a world it's opened, hasn't it? Google Maps get us where we need to be now. Google Maps has led into Waze, W-A-Z-E, if you don't know the app on your phone. Waze will tell you not only how to get where you get, it will tell you the speed limit where you are traveling, whether you're over or under the speed limit, and then it's interactive, so it will tell you where a policeman is sitting in a speed trap and you should slow down. It'll tell you where there's a broken down vehicle on the, cur on the side of the road two miles ahead. It will tell you where traffic has slowed and reroute you, reroute you around the traffic to get you to your destination quicker. It will tell you if a piece of garbage has fallen off a truck and is in the middle of the road a quarter of a mile ahead. GPS is a wonderful thing because it helps us get where we need to go. Without it, a lot of times I'd be lost. The psalm today, Psalm 25, is an important psalm because it begins this first week in Lent as a way of directing us God's GPS, if you will, our geocaching in our own spiritual journey as disciples, as people of faith. There are a couple of things about the psalm today that I want to point out that teach me about this this faith journey that I'm meant to be on. The first one is that God's way is a way that is not intuitively known. We can't just figure it out on our own. It's not always easy to get where we need to go without a map or a GPS. Have you had the experience of getting lost? Even with GPS, sometimes they're not perfect. Sometimes we miss the way. I remember one particularly fun experience with my kids. Rob and I were taking the kids to King's Dominion one day. We're heading down 95 to King's Dominion for an amazing day with our family. They can't wait to get to the amusement park. 
But it said we were a lot closer than I remember King's Dominion being. It told me to get off the road, so I did. It told me to turn left and then turn right and then go through a stop sign and stop at a sign, a stop at a stop light, proceed through the light and continue. I did. But then we ended up going into a very odd development of houses. Pretty houses, but nowhere that I remembered King's Dominion being. It said that we were a mile away from our destination, then a half mile, and then a quarter mile, and Still, King's Dominion seemed nowhere in sight. I pulled up in front of someone's house, and it said, you've reached your destination. It wasn't King's Dominion. They did have a really nice swing set, though. But it wasn't where we meant to be. Sometimes GPS don't get it perfect. The psalmist tells us today that God's way is not intuitive to our own understanding. Teach me your way, the psalmist says. You don't need to be taught something if you already know it. You don't need to be taught something if you don't need to know it. And you don't need to be taught something you can teach yourself. I have students in my German classes who really enjoy learning the language. But I always have one or two who just don't bother showing up. They never crack their book. They never study. I had one student come to me one semester. And after class, he looks at me, and in his best Keanu Reeves impression, which was his real voice, by the way, he says, dude, this is hard. I looked at him, and I said in my best Keanu Reeves voice, dude, no crap. Okay, number one, it would be Dr. Dude to you. Number two, you never come to class. Number three, when you do try to show up, you're usually half asleep or under the influence of something at 9 o'clock in the morning, and you never come prepared. What part of you thought advanced German grammar would be easy? He said, is there anything I can do to pass this class? I said, absolutely there is. What? What? You can take it again next semester and actually apply yourself before you waste more of dad's money. Have a good day. You see, the psalmist tells us that we can be taught, but we need to know. The psalmist tells us that it's not, not God's way is sort of like learning a foreign language or the piano. It's not something we can teach ourselves very effectively. The psalmist also tells us we don't have to be perfect at it. He says, don't remember the sins of my youth. According to your steadfast love, O Lord, remember me. Our ability to walk the way of faith, the psalmist tells us, is really not about our worthiness. It's about God's steadfast love. Let me repeat that because it's such a seminal thought for our Lenten journey. Our ability to walk the path of faith is not about our worthiness. It's about God's steadfast love. We don't have to be perfect. Chesed is the word, H-E-S-E-D, in the, in the English transliteration of the Hebrew. Chesed is steadfast love. This is what one theologian wrote this week. Chesed is not merely an emotion or a feeling but involves the action on behalf of someone who is in need. Chesed describes a sense of love and loyalty that inspires merciful and compassionate behavior toward another. You see, chesed is not a passive love. It's an active love. Chesed is not just a feeling. It's a behavior. You may have people that you love in your life. Right? People you admire. I love certain actors and actresses. I love Glenn Close. I love Anne Hathaway. I love George Clooney. I will see anything they do. They don't choose bad roles, really, do they? Anything they're in is kind of worth my $12 at the movie theater. But that's not steadfast love. That's admiration. 
I've never had a relationship with Glenn Close or Anne Hathaway or George Clooney. I've never been able to have a, an active kind of relationship. It's not our thing. I'm an admirer. That's all. Chesed is the covenant kind of steadfast love you have with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your students, with your faculty, with your church family. Chesed is steadfast love that's not just emotion. I admire what you do. I will watch any movie you make because you're a quality actor. No. It's about behavior of compassion and love for someone with whom we are in covenant. It relates to the concept of love. Chesed expresses God's faithfulness to God's people. It's not just God loves us. It's that God is active in pursuit of a relationship, a covenant with God's people. The last thing the psalmist tells me about this faith journey is, first, that it can be learned. We have to ask God to teach us. Secondly, that we don't have to be perfect, that our sins can be forgiven and we can begin again because this journey is not dependent on my perfection but on God's steadfast love. And now the psalmist says it's our role to be a part of the process. All the paths of the Lord, the psalmist says, are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep God's commandments and ordinances. The first verse of the psalm begins, To you, Yahweh, I lift up my soul, O my God. The language teacher in me is going to come out again, so just forgive me for this. To you, Yahweh, I lift up my soul. That's also an active sentence. Passive would be, to you, Yahweh, my soul is lifted up by someone else, right? No. To you, Yahweh, to you, O God, I lift my soul. I'm choosing. I'm deciding. I'm acting. I'm giving. My life is an offering to the Holy One. The psalmist says that once I understand that I can learn the way of faithfulness, once I learn that my past no longer chains me, but that it frees me to begin again the journey of faithful love to God, then I need to take the first step. I need to make an offering of my life to the Holy One. That's really what Lent is, isn't it? My choice to offer my life to my God. To God, who's proven trustworthy, faithful, and steadfast. Have you ever found yourself feeling guarded around someone you love? Someone you worked with? Someone you had to be in a situation with? Have you ever felt yourself feeling like you had to protect yourself a little bit? Why is that? It's because you haven't felt safe. It's because you weren't able to trust someone. What the psalmist is teaching us today is that risk is only possible with trust. Risk, vulnerability, can only come if we feel safe. The psalmist tells us today that spiritual risk, spiritual vulnerability, naming our sin, naming our weaknesses, naming our humanity, being honest about those things we should change, it leads us to surrender. And it only happens if we first understand the steadfast love of God is our safe place. Surrender. Risk, vulnerability, trust, the steadfastness of a God who loves us. That's the Lenten journey. Risk is only possible with trust. Risk leads us to surrender. And surrender leads us to the cross. Amen.